assaulted by brutalism. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I just want to preface this this talk, and I'll try and be as brief as I can, um, by saying that this is uh, the, the the material I'm presenting today comes out of research that was done for this exhibition. This is a catalog from an exhibition I prepared with my colleague from Ryerson University, Professor Colin Ripley, Architecture and National Identity. Uh, the Centennial Project's 50 years on, so it's it's quite a broad sweep looking at the impact of the Centennial Project on um, Canadian architecture. This will be a much more focused talk specifically on uh, the situation in Ontario and Toronto. Um, with some references to how they fit into the larger scheme of things. Um, we can't really talk about the ambitions behind the Centennial Project without acknowledging that a lot of them come out of this report, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, usually referred to in shorthand as the Massey Report, the Report of the Royal Commission on National Development in the Arts, Letters and Sciences, published in 1951. The Massey Commission was first pulled together in 1949, and really what we're seeing here is an effort to come to terms with uh, an emergent national identity. Uh, after World War II, uh, Canada is starting to uh, distance itself from its uh, historical colonial identity, um, and of course it's uh, um, very aware and very um, uh, nervous about having uh, American culture become um, overly dominant uh, in the absence of, their, of, of Canada's historic identity. So the Commission really pulls together an extraordinary document that led to um, the establishment of many important cultural institutions in the country, including the Canada Council for the Arts, um, the uh, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and so on. So a really foundational document. Um, of its 500 or so pages, I think it's six that are devoted to architecture. Um, typically sort of a neglected art <laughs> uh, within the arts, letters, and sciences. But it makes some very important observations. And one of the things that it establishes is the need for cultural infrastructure through architecture to support all these other activities. So if we're going to have a robust culture, whether it be a culture of visual art, a culture of performance, a culture of literature, etc., th there's also a, a sort of built infrastructure that comes with that. And one of the things that we see happening uh, really more towards the, the sort of the mid to late 1950s is an explosion in the provision of these kinds of cultural buildings in Canada. Um, projects like the Festival Theatre in Stratford, Ontario by Ranthwaite and Fairfield, 1957. The Queen Elizabeth Theatre in Vancouver, 1959. Uh, this was the subject of a competition which was won by the Montreal firm Affleck, Debara, Dimakopoulos, Lebensold, Michaud and Size, who will heretofore be referred to as ARCOP. Um, uh, the O'Keeffe Centre here in Toronto by Earl C. Morgan with Page and Steele, uh, and of course the lead architect at Page and Steele being Peter Dickinson. Um, Place des Arts in Montreal, again by Arcop. So you can see the kind of uh, context in which um, the uh, late 50s, early 60s in Canada are starting to really look seriously at architecture, um, not only as a vessel and infrastructure for culture, but as expressions of culture in and of itself. So architecture is really starting to take on an important role in expressing the identity of the country. It's also worth noting that 1958, Canada builds its um, exhibition pavilion at the Venice Biennale, so it now has a presence on the international stage. At the 1958 um, Expo in Brussels, uh, for the first time, Canada doesn't exhibit exclusively its, its sort of products as a resource-based nation, but the pavilion, the Canadian Pavilion in 1958 is actually dedicated primarily to contemporary visual art. So we really see a kind of move away from Canada as strictly representing itself as a resource nation and one that is really starting to take on a kind of cultural dimension. So it's in this context that we see the beginnings of the Centennial Program, and this really gets uh, its kickoff at the 53rd Annual Meeting of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, which took place in Winnipeg, June 1960. Uh, the Prime Minister at the time, John Diefenbaker, addresses the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. And he basically says that um, we are approaching the centennial. It's very important that we celebrate the centennial as a nation. And he specifically addresses the architects and says, I ask that you, the members of this profession, should play a most important part. And I ask you to do that and to present to the centennial committee as soon as possible your views and suggestions for this celebration. Something to touch the hearts of Canadians, something to represent the unity of our country. Pretty tall order. But he's, he's now expressing that architecture has a role to play in this. It's not clear at this point yet what that role is or how, how large that role would become. But not long after he gives this talk, we see the beginnings of the first centennial project to be uh, carried out in Canada. And that, of course, 
is the Fathers of Confederation Memorial Building in Charlottetown, PEI. Charlottetown being the location of the first Confederation Conference in 1864, it's looking to create a building by 1964 ahead of the National Centennial to commemorate that first Confederation Conference. This really starts out as a local initiative. There are a number, number of important players in uh, Charlottetown that are looking to create a memorial project. They lobby the federal government for support. There's no centennial program in place at this time. They are successful. They have the competition. The competition is won by ARCOP. That's uh, Dimitri Dimakopoulos there, partner in charge of the project with uh, John Diefenbaker. So this is now January 1962. The project is about to begin. And as a result of this project, other, other provinces come forward. Quebec, of course, was the, the location of the second Confederation Conference. We want a building too. Pretty soon, everyone wants to be involved in this, in this project, and the federal government actually initiates two programs that I'll talk about um, it, it, shortly. Uh, so two distinct programs to, to finance a very significant, ambitious uh, program of archi centennial architecture. This is the competition model for the Fathers of Confederation Memorial Building. It's worth spending just a moment talking about this project because as the first project, it kind of establishes a, a tone or culture for the projects that follow. Um, it's been described as a brutalist building. It's not brutalism in the sense that we normally think of with you know, the, the, this, this kind of brutalism, the very heavy, expressive uh, concrete. In fact, this building is clad in a beautiful um, green Wallace sandstone to match the historic province house, which you can see here um, on the, uh, the right of the slide. So that is the actual location of the initial Confederation Conference. The new complex essentially relates to it. And you can see in this image the relationship or the view from the, um, the new building looking back to uh, the provincial government or the provincial building in which the Confederation Conference took place. And uh, not a not a great color reproduction here, but you get a sense of the, of the color of the sandstone. So at the time that this building was completed, it was praised for how um, uh, contextual it was in relation to the historic provincial building. So uh, it, it remains below the height of the original building. It uses the same material, but it's an extremely abstract building. It's, it, if you visit this building, it's very difficult to figure out where the entrance is, for example. There isn't a clear hierarchy. It's very much uh, an abstraction, in a sense, of a landscape. Um, and that's something I want to talk a little bit about with some of the subsequent projects. I also think it's worth taking just a moment to look at a couple of the other competition entries for this project uh, from uh, Toronto Architects. This is the competition by uh, the Parkin Partnership, John B. Parkin Associates. Uh, this actually got an honorable mention. It's an extremely strange project. Um, I don't think it's one we would normally recognize as a Parkin project, and you can see the the kind of um, uh, sweeping curvilinear form at work here. But this is some of the work that was being pro um, proposed. This is 1961, the time of the competition. And this is the submission by Raymond Moriyama, which I think is worth having just a quick look at in the context of where we are today. So this is Moriyama, 1961, very kind of monumental project. Um, the successful project, of course, was the ARCOP project. Um, a few years later, uh, after the presentation by Diefenbaker to the RAIC, the second Prime Minister addressed the RAIC annual general meeting, uh, this time in 1964 in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Uh, Lester Pearson uh, came to further promote what was now a program in full swing. So when Diefenbaker spoke to the architects, the program had not yet been established. By now, it's in full swing, and Pearson is encouraging uh, participation. Um, and here's the extraordinarily eloquent thing that he said to the architects. It was Montesquieu who argued in the 18th century that national character derived primarily from geography and climate. If that is so, then today architecture may well have a greater responsibility for national character than any other profession has. For today, as our population moves more and more to urban centers, it is buildings which make our geography. So it's not just the landscapes, it's the buildings as landscape that become really important. And Diefenbaker is saying this, uh, sorry, Pearson is saying this in 1964. In the 1960s, there's tremendous um, um, interest in the relationship between architecture and landscape to the point where architecture essentially takes on landscape form. It's almost an, analo an analogous form. So rather than um, dealing with the, the traditional vocabulary of architecture, we see this very experimental and innovative architecture that deals with landscape 
um, we could say on its own terms. It deals with it in terms of enormous scale. Here's Simon Fraser University, Scarborough College, um, another project by Arthur Erickson, the University of Lethbridge, and of course Habitat at Expo, which is essentially a constructed hill town, right? We don't have a hill, so we'll build it. Um, in other cases, you see architecture that adopts a kind of landscape aesthetic almost, right? It's, 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 it's not the traditional rectilinear urban architecture that we might um, be familiar with. It's architecture that embraces landscape form as a generator of form and identity. Now, this is, of course, happening in the 1960s. So is this. Uh, this is Northrop Fry. Um, and I just wanted to speak briefly about um, his, his description of the Canadian identity in his conclusion to the literary history of Canada. And I think uh, anyone who's interested in Fry and who has read um, literary criticism from this period is familiar with his discussion of the garrison mentality. So he talks about Canadian identity as expressed through literature being formulated around ideas of landscape. The garrison, and, this, and he's writing this in 1965, so this is just around the same time as the Centennial Projects are happening. Uh, the garrison mentality, of course, refers to the notion that um, the, the Canadian uh, um, condition is one of uh, a, um, a very overwhelming, sometimes hostile environment that requires settlement that uh, basically conceives itself in a protective manner. So we, we group together, we huddle together in a garrison, we, we, we close ourselves against the threat um, of, the, of, the, of the great, um, um, well, uh, Michael used the word, I think, the sublime, the sublime landscape. And the sublime, of course, implies a kind of dual response. It's both terrifying but also alluring. And that's the other side of Fry's analysis here. He talks about the garrison mentality, and that's one that we're, I think we're pretty familiar with, that terminology. But he also talks about the idea of the pastoral myth, and that in Canadian literature, according to Fry, we have this kind of dualistic relationship to nature. On the one hand, we're scared of it, we, we respect it, we, we blockade ourselves against it, we build against it in these fortress-like communities, but we also have this kind of um, archetype or fantasy of being one with nature, of being in communion with nature, and that's the pastoral myth. Um, and it's the, this duality, Fry tells us, that kind of establishes a, a notion of Canadian identity. There's also, of course, uh, the moment in architecture um, that is very interested in brutalism, as Michael mentioned earlier. Um, and we have this idea of, of um, brutalism that originates in Europe, mostly, primarily, originally, at least, through the writing of Reiner Bannum. Um, and he's writing as early as the mid-1950s, publishes this book in the mid-1960s, which addresses this notion of brutalism. Um, and he identifies three, three particular elements. Memorability as an image, clear exhibition of structure, and the valuation of materials for their inherent qualities as found. So as Michael was saying, major cultural projects do, no longer have to be made out of marble or limestone. We can use concrete. It has this sort of as-found quality. Um, and it also deals with ideas of egalitarianism and accessibility. Um, two images here, one of the British National Theatre uh, constructed in London in 1951 and the National Arts Centre in the late 1960s in Ottawa. Hard to miss the similarities, both in terms of program, in terms of their ambition to deliver um, uh, cultural programming to the general population, culture no longer seen as an elite activity, but a, something that is accessible to all, um, and expressed in these buildings that are very much um, anti-traditional, uh, um, anti-hierarchical, um, anti-historical, and one could argue anti-elitist. Um, they are, <coughs> excuse me, again, more closely uh, lined with uh, landscape forms than they are with traditional urbanism. Um, and I just want to quickly return to the Fathers of Confederation building. So this is the plan of that uh, complex in Charlottetown by ARCOP. And you can see the expression of these sort of discrete forms. Um, number six there is the, is the historic uh, uh, province house uh, with the new forms of the art gallery, the performing arts space, and the library sort of surrounding that. Um, so that, it, that is the project as built. But this is an early sketch for the project, again by ARCOP. Um, uh, early competition sketch before they submitted. And you can see how much more abstract and landscape-like, in a sense, this original sketch was. And we see this transforming, of course, by the same practice, same firm, into the National Arts Center. 
which is much more definitively organized as a, as a building as landscape, quite disconnected from the city, quite deliberately so. Turns its back on the city, turns its back on the, uh, the urban grid, on the historic architecture of the colonial vocabulary that we see on Parliament Hill, et cetera, and orients itself to the Rideau Canal. In a sense, it becomes a, a rock outcropping on a river. Um, also note the hexagonal ge geometry, so de a deliberately breaking away from the traditional grid structure of the city. Um, and I don't know if, if anyone noticed, but uh, I was very pleased to see in Mr. Zeidler's presentation the hexagonal paving stones at Ontario Place. This was very much a theme of the time, playing with different geometries, non-rectilinear non geometries, to distinguish the contemporary from the traditional. So here's a view of the National Arts Centre, and we, got, we have to remember, of course, that all these photographs are very carefully edited, very carefully framed. It's very much about representing the building as an extension of landscape. And again, this notion of geometry playing a part um, in differentiating the contemporary from the traditional uh, by breaking away from the traditional grid. And of course, the reference to the geometries of the time, the, the, the graphic uh, moment of the time, <coughs> excuse me, the graphic identity of the time. Um, I'm sure we all, we've all seen this um, ad infinitum. Uh, this was produced with no copyright so that uh, it was available to anyone to reproduce um, on anything and we've seen it reproduced on just about everything. Um, and this kind of set dynamic sensibility also extended into the performances themselves. This is opening night at the National Arts Center, 1969. Again, this extraordinary abstract geometry playing a part in the stage set. Um, and the music for this opening performance was composed by Yanis Zanakis, who of course was a, um, one of the pioneers of modern uh, composition in the 1950s and 60s, also happened to be an architect who worked in the office of Le Corbusier. So, I mentioned there were two programs established by the federal government. One is the Confederation Memorial Program, and this gave a grant to every province and territory to construct a building of lasting uh, character. And if we quickly run down this list, you'll see that most of the projects involved uh, cultural facilities of some kind or another, or educational facilities of some kind. Uh, Newfoundland built an arts and culture center. Nova Scotia built a medical building at Dalhousie. New Brunswick uh, built a provincial administration building, so it's a bit of an outlier in terms of the typology. Uh, Quebec built a theater. Ontario, of course, the Science Center. Manitoba built a concert hall. Saskatchewan built two, one in Saskatoon and one in Regina. They split their grant. Um, Alberta built a museum and archives building. British Columbia, the same. Yukon, a civic administration building, and the Northwest Territories, a library. Um, and you can see that um, in most cases, with the, larger, with the larger provinces, the larger populations, the grant was for $2.5 million, um, which generally covered, or was intended to cover half the expense and ended up covering a fraction of the expense. And then, of course, where we are here today, and I realize with, the, with John here, the project architect for this building, this is the definitive Coles to Newcastle uh, experience for me here. Um, but I will just briefly talk about this building in the context of some of the things I've just talked about. The idea of building as landscape, the idea of brutalism as an expression that is anti-hierarchical, uh, anti-elitist, uh, that is about architecture that is accessible to a large public, and that is architecture that breaks away from traditional notions of the city. So located, of course, on this ravine landscape and very much responding to the topography of that landscape. The building is very much a part of the landscape. Um, very uh, uh, sort of bold and idiosyncratic planning. Um, uh, we see here the primary sort of entry pavilion and the rectilinear form of that in relation to the, to the pods, um, which of course uh, became transformed into the, the graphic identity for the Science Center, which also represents the Ontario Trillium, so working on a number of, of sort of symbolic levels. The sections tell us, I think, more than the plans about the character of the building in relation to landscape. Um, and there are some wonderful uh, sketches um, from the time of the building design that are part of the collection at the um, uh, Canadian Architectural Archives in Calgary. Um, so again, we see here 
the emphasis placed within the representations on the relationship of building to landscape. And this is a, a very interesting building in the sense that it is both very much related to and embedded in landscape, but it's also kind of like a spaceship that has landed from outer space, right? So, so there's, this, there's this really interesting duality between the alienness of the building and its deep connection to its landscape. Some wonderful drawings that capture some of this idea of the the technological um, a prowess of the project and its ambitions um, in that regard, but always, always represented in relationship to landscape. Truly wonderful uh, that uh, we have these um, uh, archived. Of course, in a uh, building scene in winter. And some of the interiors, again, the very carefully uh, photographed, very carefully staged photographs that capture the kind of cavernous and, and brutalist nature of the space, that capture the plasticity of the concrete. The, uh, the variation in the treatment of the concrete, also a very important aspect in, in the brutalist vocabulary. And some really fantastic ideas about uh, the interior, this, this uh, sketch for the interior of the, of the restaurant, so very much a space age kind of image. The project, and John might remember and, and uh, have more information on this, but one of the very interesting stories that we discovered in our research, the project was initially budgeted at uh, five million dollars for uh, our, for the construction and exhibit design as a totality, it ended up at about 30 million for the building alone. Uh, sorry? 25. 25, thanks. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say that. It, that's not just a budget overrun. I think it was also, you know, Moriyama's uh, prescience of understanding how popular this would be. Um, and um, some of the documents that we found in the archives talk about his encouraging the province to actually think bigger. And I think his, his vision is clearly, I think, supported by the longevity and success of the project. And just very quickly, uh, looking at this other program, so in addition to the program that was providing funding to the provinces, the, the government also made funds available to municipalities. Um, and they funded some 2,300 projects, not all of which are architectural. About 900 of those involve buildings of some description. Many of those are very modest interventions, um, but some of these are quite significant. Um, and um, there are others that followed in the Ontario Science Centre's um, uh, vein in the sense that they were not performing art centres, but they were about the space age. They were about science. They were about looking to the future. Um, this is the planetarium in Vancouver, which was the major municipal um, centennial project for the city of Vancouver. Calgary also did a planetarium. St. Paul, Alberta did a UFO landing pad. <laughs> And that's, that's the vision, that's the reality. Um, Paul, Paul Hellyer, who was Minister of Defense at the time, attended the opening um, and arranged for a flyover by the uh, Air Force jets. <laughs> and here in Toronto, um, a really good example of something that was going on, you know, we think of the Centennial Projects primarily as these futuristic, forward-looking buildings, and most of them are, most of the sort of major ones are, but there were also a number of projects that dealt with historic buildings and historic fabric, and the St. Lawrence Hall in Toronto is one of those and one of the more important ones um, that were part of the uh, municipal grants uh, funding. So William Thomas's St. Lawrence Hall was a restoration project in 1967. Uh, a new project for the City of Toronto was um, initially called Festival Hall. This is an early sketch by Gordon Adamson and Associates that ended up being the St. Lawrence Centre for the Arts down on Front Street. And here it is with its former graphic glory, uh, the logo designed by Burton Kramer. Uh, some other very fine, smaller projects around uh, Toronto and, and the GTA. Uh, Mimico Centennial Library by Bansbrook, Carruthers, Grierson Shaw, which won a Massey Medal in 1966. 
And Oakville um, also built a very impressive uh, complex of centennial buildings, which includes a gallery, performing arts center, uh, swimming pool, et cetera. Here we're just seeing the building on its upper level. This is also on a sloping site, and the rest of the building sort of terraces down behind this. So following again in this tradition of very strong relationship to landscape. Um, there's so much more to talk about, but I know I've gone over time. So thank you very much.